Well, welcome everybody. I am Dr. Ted Barnett, president and founder of Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute. I'm so excited to have people joining us, so many people joining us tonight. Uh, welcome to my gazebo in Western New York. Announce how excited we are about our uh, tonight's Lifestyle as Medicine lecture, which is analyzing, understanding, and promoting the vegan diet with Glenn Merzer. Uh, just a review of our LMI programs. We run two uh, uh, American College of Lifestyle Medicine certified programs, uh, our own 15-day whole food plant-based ju uh, jumpstart program, which we consider the prescription for chronic disease. And we also run the LIFT project, um, which was developed by Dr. Darren Morton in Australia. And then we have a uh, health coaching available for um, uh, anybody who's interested. We also run a, um, uh, a new uh, community platform called paleblue.community, which is now where we host our a lecture series. And um, if you uh, become a member, you'll have access to uh, uh, Lifestyles Medicine video recordings, transcripts, chat logs, and discussions. Uh, it's a simple, easy to use interface. It, uh, it also incorporates our events, courses, and programs. It's hard to explain in 30 seconds, so I won't try, but take uh, please uh, visit. There's a 30-day free trial membership. After that, it's uh, $5 a month, or you can um, pay by the year if you'd like. Let me just tell you a little bit about our uh, speaker tonight. Len Merzer has authored or, uh, or co-authored more than a dozen books with a vegan message. Uh, his latest book is America Goes Vegan with over 120 vegan gluten-free recipes by Tracy Childs. Glenn also wrote Food is Climate, which argues that the only way to reverse climate change is to eliminate animal agriculture and to protect the oceans from industrial fishing. In addition, Glenn is the author of Own Your Health, an examination of the role of nutrition in health, to which Chef AJ contributed more than 75 recipes. Glenn is co-author of The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss, Unprocessed, this 10th anniversary edition of Unprocessed, and the forthcoming Sweet Indulgence by Chef AJ. Glenn is now the host of The Glenn Merzer Show, which can be found on YouTube and other podcast platforms. And you can find Glenn and contact him at glennmerzer.com. So without further ado, let us bring on Glenn Merzer. If you could uh, turn on your video, Glenn. Welcome aboard. It's so great to have you here. Thank and, you, Ted. It's a yeah. pleasure to be here. Great, great. And later on, we will be introducing Dr. Susan Friedman, who will be helping uh, with the Q&A. But we'll leave her. Uh... Oh, and it looks like we have Dr. Graff here as well, Dr. Kerry Graff. So anyway, um, Glenn, if you'd like to start sharing. Thank you, everyone, for being here. The title of the presentation is Analyzing, Understanding, and Promoting the Vegan Diet. Now, there are the many different terms used by advocates of a diet of plant foods. The one I use most often is simply the vegan diet, which has the drawback of being a term that defines itself by what isn't in the diet, animal foods. A vegan diet could be a diet, diet of soda pop and vegan donuts. So a vegan diet is not necessarily a healthy diet. To correct that problem, Dr. T. Colin Campbell coined the phrase whole food plant-based diet, emphasizing eating whole fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes rather than, say, vegan junk food. But the term plant-based is vague. Somebody could eat fish or meat once or twice or even three times a week and argue that they're on a plant-based diet because they mostly eat plants. My friend, uh, Chef AJ, likes to use the term plant-exclusive diet to make it clear that she doesn't endorse eating any animal foods. Dr. Alan Goldhammer uses the term whole plant food diet with the same emphasis as Dr. Campbell on eating whole plant foods, but without what could be viewed as the leap, loophole phrase plant-based. Dr. John McDougall calls it a starch-based diet, emphasizing that the diet only works if you get the bulk of your calories from starches foods like potatoes, corn, rice, wheat, squashes, and beans. Rip Esselstyn likes the term plant-strong diet, and many people simply say plant-based diet. One minor quibble with any of the names that include the word plant is that it's technically a slight to mushrooms. Everybody agrees mushrooms are healthy, but of course they're not plants, they're fungi. So why do I prefer the term vegan, which is the least descriptive and could permit permit the least healthy diet of all the terms on the list? Because to most people, the term for people who don't eat animal foods is vegan. And I embrace that term because I wanna end animal agriculture and I want nobody to eat animal foods. When you go to a restaurant, they label dishes vegetarian or vegan, not starch-based or whole food or, whole, whole, or plant exclusive. So I wanna embrace the term that the rest of the world uses for us but if I'm talking about health, I make it clear. 
eat a whole food, oil-free, sugar-free, low-fat vegan diet, not any old vegan diet. And, and, so, and so far, it appears that the world isn't listening to me. Uh, vegans are, are generally estimated at only about 2% of the population, and healthy, whole food, low-fat vegans would be a fraction of that 2%. So why is it hard to get people to eat the healthiest human diet? Because we are the foray. The foray people of Papua New Guinea had a big problem in the 1950s and 60s. Many were dying of a horrible disease called kuru, their word for shivering. The victims would shake, develop facial spasms, and lose the ability to walk and to control their bodily functions and to swallow, and then they would die. It's 100% fatal. It affected mostly women and some children. It was due to their unfortunate practice of cannibalism. The women had decided not long before the 50s that it was a shame to waste the good meat of their dead relatives and allow it to be eaten by worms. And so the tradition grew to honor their loved ones by consuming the whole corpse, all cooked and eaten, including the brains. This was in part revenge against the men, who always ate the best parts of pigs and gave women the leftovers. As payback, the women ate more of their loved ones than did the men, and it was always the women who ate the brains, or they may have shared a little bit of brain with their children. Well, it turns out, ironically, that eating brains is not smart. Many 4A women were dying of kuru, so many that the male to female ratio began to approach three to one. It was ultimately determined with the help of a Nobel Prize winning, winning researcher named Kalten Gaidusek, who studied at the University of Rochester in the early 40s. It was determined that there was an infectious agent involved in Kuru that was not actually alive. It's a misfolded protein now called a prion. Prion diseases include scrapie in sheep, mad cow disease in cows, chronic wasting in deer, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in humans, and Kuru in humans. About one in a million people will for no known reason get a misfolded protein, a prion, in their brain and develop Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, always fatal. That must have happened to one of the 4A people. But then when his or her infected brain was eaten by many women, they got kuru. And then when their brains were e eaten, you can see why it's not smart to eat brains. But the 4A were taught by Westerners to stop with the cannibalism, and they stopped, and they're not dying of kuru anymore. Now, it's easy to condemn cannibalism, which seems like a terribly primitive, unthinkable crime against nature and humanity. But from a health perspective, it's really no different than eating cows. From a health perspective, flesh is flesh, cow, horse, pig, fish, or person. We could look down on a culture that was cannibalistic, but there's no scientific reason to believe that eating cows is any more sensible or health healthy for human beings than eating your uncle. And our decisions on what we should eat are just as irrationally grounded in cultural traditions as the decisions made by the foray. If anything, our culture has proven more resistant to change than theirs. We are the foray, and in overcoming our misguided habit of eating animals, we now need to try to emulate their comparative openness to progress. It's not universally accepted, of course, that meat is unhealthy. There are plenty of meat promoters out there, and there are even research studies that are occasionally published that conclude that there's nothing wrong with meat eating. Probably the most widely reported study in the last decade to make the case for meat consumption became known as the Red Meat Papers, published in October 2019. What kind of research study did they do, you might ask, that found some health advantage to meat eating? Well, they didn't do any research, and they didn't find any health advantage to meat eating. Wait a minute, then how come the study made headlines around the world? Researchers endorsed continued current levels of meat eating consumption. Well, they did what's called a meta-analysis of existing research. The authors put together a panel of 14 people, not all with health science backgrounds, and asked them to review existing nutritional research using metrics designed for the analysis of pharmaceutical drugs. The gold standard of drug research is double-blind randomized controlled trials, but most nutritional studies are self-reporting studies of what people eat since it's pretty hard to assign people at random to eat certain diets that they may not want to eat for extensive periods of time, and it's impossible to do so in a double-blind way for them not to know what they're eating. Therefore, the panel gave a, quote, weak grade to all the evidence it reviewed, 
while acknowledging that the evidence showed that red meat consumption is associated with increased risks of heart disease, stroke, cancer, and all-cause mortality. It then weighed that weak evidence against a more, quote, critically important factor in its grading system, the proposition that people do not have a, quote, willingness to change unprocessed or processed meat consumption. That's it. That was the whole study. It was accomplished using an arbitrary point system. They reviewed studies, awarded a few points for the diet that led to less heart disease, stroke, and cancer, a longer life, the plant-based diet, but awarded more points to the meat-heavy diet because it did not have the undesirable effect of causing people to modify their meal preparation and eating habits. They then took a vote. I'll bet you didn't know that nutritional science was a democracy. They took a vote and the panel of 14 arguably unqualified people voted 11 to 3 to recommend continued meat consumption. That made headlines around the world. I bring up the red meat papers to give you an idea of exactly how badly designed some research studies can be. When people try to make the case for eating meat and dairy, they often say that they read this study or that study that said that meat eating is healthy or at least not too unhealthy. Um, or that they read an article that vegans have weak bones or smaller brains or their teeth fall out. The internet is full of disinformation. The truth is that the overwhelming evidence in scientific studies supports a plant-based diet. Study after study show that the plant-based diet leads to healthier blood pressure, lower risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer than a diet high in animal foods. I'm saying plant-based because often these studies are just that, studies of people eating more plants and less meat, not people on a whole food, low-fat, vegan diet. There aren't enough of us. Study after study shows that the plant-based diet leads to a healthier weight than a diet high in animal foods. But if you look for it, you could also find studies that cast shade specifically on the vegan diet. It took me just a minute to find a study that claimed, quote, Vegans have a greater prevalence of mental health problems, which may lead to a poorer quality of life. An optimal diet should be balanced, consisting of lean meat, nuts, fresh fruits and vegetables, and olive oil. A wholesome diet is essential in maintaining a healthy gut flora, which in turn is pivotal, pivotal in avoiding inflammatory disorders. Now, if you're a committed longtime vegan, you read an attack associating veganism with mental health problems, and you roll your eyes and wonder what's the basis for this extraordinary accusation. But if you're not a vegan, or maybe you're considering becoming a vegan, it sounds alarming. Vegans have a greater prevalence of mental health problems. That doesn't sound good. Maybe the vegan diet is too extreme if it leads to mental health problems. On the other hand, I could spend a month showing you studies that show alarming risks to eating meat. Risks of many different types of cancer, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and more. So let's come back to this quote, casting shade on veganism later, and see if it's true and just how worrisome it should be. Most nutritional research involves self-reporting. People go home, eat whatever they want to eat, and once a week or so try to remember what they ate or fill out a food diary or fill out a questionnaire. Believe it or not, there was actually a study done of self-reporting studies, and it found, quote, a strong and consistent systematic, systematic under-reporting of energy intake across adults and children studies. So if people either don't remember everything they ate or they under-report when they binge on ice cream and cookies. Self-reporting studies are for the most part highly dubious, and that's most studies that you come across. If you do a study of meat eaters versus vegans, you run into these complicating factor factors. Are the self-reported vegans on a healthy, whole foods, low-fat vegan diet, or are they eating French fries and drinking Coke? Did the self-reported vegans become vegan at age 65 after being diagnosed with heart disease? Are some of the meat eaters eating more fruits and vegetables than the vegans? And then there are lifestyle factors like exercise, smoking, drinking, and drug use that affect health. Why is it that you could find a study to support almost any proposition in the world of nutrition? Because they do so many bad studies. There's a lot of money in research and studies are done that are designed to create confusion. Maybe there's an incentive for research scientists to create confusion because that enables them to get more grants to do more studies. 
Again, even though most studies show health advantages to the vegan diet, it's probably not worth your time to debate studies. Chances are that you're not a nutritional research scientist and neither is the person you're debating with. And since many nutritional studies are badly designed, a debate between two people who are not familiar with the drawbacks of the dubious studies they're citing is a debate worth nobody's time. So for those of you who may want to promote the vegan diet, what's the best way to do it? Is it to make the moral argument against killing animals? Is it to make the environmental argument because animal agriculture just so happens to have a horrific impact on our land, is the leading cause of deforestation and biodiversity loss, pollutes our waterways, and is a leading cause of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? The difficulty with persuading people on moral and environmental grounds is that the meat defender may readily concede those points, but say that unfortunately they still need to eat animal foods because it's vital to their health. Who wrote these words? Quote, choosing to avoid meat and eat a plant-based diet has never seemed so virtuous and necessary. Between the intrinsic cruelty of industrial livestock production and livestock's climate footprint, estimated by the UN's FAO to be 14.5% of greenhouse gases worldwide, significantly greater than that of plant agriculture, it has become increasingly difficult to defend the place of meat and animal sourced foods in our diet. These words were written by Gary Taubes, perhaps America's leading advocate of beef eating and the keto diet. Even Gary Taubes concedes the animal, animal cruelty argument and the environmental argument. He just believes that though it's a shame that animal agriculture destroys the environment and is cruel to animals, eating them is healthy. So if we win the health argument, the other side has nothing left, left as Gary Taubes has effectively conceded. Therefore, the health argument is paramount to persuading people. But the problem is that, as we've seen, debating nutritional studies is a dead end. Instead, let's analyze diet. We can all agree on the five components of food that we need to consume in, in sufficient amounts to meet our dietary needs. We call them the macronutrients, carbohydrate, protein, fat, water, and fiber. Now, complicating things, there just may be a sixth macronutrient, which we will return to at the end of the presentation. The sixth macronutrient is not yet accepted by established science, but I'll make the case for it later. For now, let's limit ourselves to an analysis of the five basic macronutrients. If you're debating diet with someone who claims that there's some benefit to eating animal foods, challenge them to identify where that benefit is. That's not too much to ask. Surely it has to be in at least one of the macronutrients. If it isn't in the water, the fiber, the protein, the fat, or carbohydrate, where could the advantage possibly be? So let's analyze the macronutrients to see where the animal food advantage could possibly lie. Now, severe dehydration can lead to seizures, kidney failure, coma, death. Chronic dehydration could lead to kidney stones, reduced kidney function, urinary tract infections, constipation, poor sleep, muscle damage and muscle spasms. Water is important. Do you drink eight classes of water per day? Most of us don't. That's what's recommended to prevent dehydration. But you'd have to have a glass of water at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., noon, every two hours until 10 p.m. That's eight classes of water. How many people do anything like that? I, I don't know anyone who drinks a glass of water every two hours. In the lay press, you'll often read that 75% of Americans are dehydrated. There's actually no study that supports that number. Still, it's a safe bet that a significant percentage of Americans don't take in enough water. But you don't have to get your water from a glass. You could obtain it from food. Now, what's more full of water, plants or animal foods? Answer, plant foods. Apples are 86% water by weight. Cantaloupes, 89%. Strawberries, 92%. Zucchini and tomatoes are each 94%. Celery, 95%. Cucumber and romaine lettuce are 96% water. Almost all fruits and vegetables are almost all water by weight. And it's the best, healthiest water on the planet. It's plant-filtered water. How do you make oatmeal? You boil oats, rice, buckwheat, millet, barley, quinoa, these are all cooked in water and the grains absorb the water that's been purified to a large extent by boiling. 
Even legumes, beans, and lentils absorb the cooking water. But you don't boil bacon or a sausage or a burger, and they wouldn't absorb any water if they did. So you have the filtered water that's naturally in plants, and you also gain water from cooking grains and legumes. I might have a big bowl of oatmeal in the morning, serve it over some mixed greens, top it with berries and grapes, and I'm probably getting as much water as if I drank three or four glasses. But is there any water in meat? Yes, there's some water in meat. Meat has to be cooked, of course, and the higher the cooking temperature, the more water will be lost. Cooked meat, beef, or chicken, for example, will generally be about 50 to 60% water. Some of that often comes from what's called the flavor solutions of water, salt, and sodium phosphate injected into the meat by supermarkets to freshen up the taste of foul decaying carcasses. Some of the water content is also what's called retained water. It's the water used to wash the feces off the carcasses in the slaughterhouses. So you've got your choice of eating plant foods that are rich with naturally filtered water, um, or eating animal foods and getting a little bit of slaughterhouse water and liquid flavoring from supermarkets. Clearly, advantage plants. There's probably been no avenue of nutritional science that's advanced more in the last 40 years than the study of fiber. We know that it healthfully slows down digestion, normalizes blood sugar levels, carries cholesterol out of the body, promotes healthy colonies of bacteria in the gut, lowers the risk of heart disease, diabetes, diverticular disease, colon cancer, and constipation, and has countless other beneficial effects, including fighting depression. Of course, fiber is only in plant foods. There's absolutely no fiber in any animal foods, unless you get lucky and eat a fish that swallowed part of a fishing net. One reason you need fiber is for the metabolites they produce. Metabolites are substances produced by metabolism, the reactions in our cells that change food into energy. And it just so happens that dietary fiber is crucial to creating metabolites that improve our health and even metabolites that can improve our mood. As explained in the book Fiber Fueled by Dr. Will Bolshevitz, Plants protect and nourish us in large part because of fiber. So forafane from cruciferous vegetables, for example, increases the healthy gut microbes like butyrates and repairs the intestinal lining to reverse leaky gut. But it just so happens that metabolites from meat consumption are dangerous. In the words of Dr. B, when people ingest L-carnitine, the gut bacteria produce TMAO, increased TMAO, means increased risk of heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, type two diabetes, chronic kidney disease, peripheral artery disease, congestive heart failure, and atrial fibrillation. To sum it up, fiber is what your body craves to create health promoting metabolites. Animal foods have no fiber and it just so happens they create toxic metabolites. The macronutrient score is now plants two, animals zero. If there's any advantage to be found in animal foods, it's clearly got nothing to do with water or fiber. There's a serious deficit to animal foods in these two categories, vital to human health. So it's time to move on to carbohydrate, which is the most misunderstood macronutrient. So in order to evaluate this particular comparison between plant foods and animal foods, we need to understand it better. Let's start with the question, <clears throat> are potatoes carbohydrates? No, potatoes are not carbs. Potatoes are a root vegetable, like beets and sweet potatoes. 90% of the calories in a sweet potato come from carbohydrate, 9% from protein, 1% fat. 86% of the calories in a carrot come from carbohydrate. 9% from protein, 5% from fat. 83% of the calories in beets come from carbohydrate. 13% come from protein, 4% from fat. And the russet potato, <clears throat> excuse me, 88% come from carbohydrate, 11% from protein, 1% from fat. So you can see that the potato is in line with other root vegetables in having most of its calories from carbohydrate, but still with a significant amount of protein and a smidgen of fat. If you try to reduce a potato to a carb, you're ignoring its significant protein content 
ignoring its slight amount of fat, ignoring its substantial content of water, which is about 75 to 80% of the potato by weight, and ignoring its fiber. It contains all five macronutrients, after all, as all human foods does, and you're ignoring the vitamins and minerals it contains, B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium. So it's not a carb, it's a whole food, it's a root vegetable. We have to stop calling potato or pasta carbs. This is a destructive myth. The only foods that should be identified with single macronutrients are the ones I've listed. All oils and butter and margarine are 100% fat, so it's accurate to refer to them as fat. Sugar in all its forms, white sugar, brown sugar, agave nectar, coconut sugar, it's all sugar, it's all carbohydrate. Egg whites are pretty close to being a pure protein. Potatoes are not a carb. Here's why the potato is a great weight loss food. Even though potatoes are very filling, there's actually less than one calorie per gram, per gram of potato. Now, how can that be? People call potatoes carbs, right? And we know that there are four calories per gram of carbohydrate. So how can there be less than one calorie per gram of potato if it's carbohydrate? Shouldn't potatoes be four calories per gram? Answer, potatoes are not a carb. As I said, they're a root vegetable. And by weight, they're mostly water, mostly fiber and water. So you're filling yourself up on a vegetable that's got a lot of zero calorie content, a lot of fiber and water. How about bread? Is bread a carb? No. Ezekiel of sprouted grain bread made with sprouted wheat, filtered water, sprouted barley, sprouted millet, lentils, soybeans, sprouted spelt, yeast, gluten, and sesame seeds is 80 calories per slice, and it's 25% protein with one gram of fat. It's about 70% carbohydrate, so it's not a carb. It's a processed food, but as breads go, it's a pretty healthy one with a range of nutrients. How about tortillas? Are they carbs? I have a package of corn tortillas. It's got 60 calories, about four of which come from protein and three from fat. And this is clearly protein and fat that derives from the corn. So the tortilla is not a carb. Is pasta a carb? I've got some red lentil penne made from red lentil flour and brown rice flour in that three and a half ounce serving. It's got 22 grams of protein and two grams of fat. It's extremely high in protein. It's not a carb. How about regular old semolina wheat pasta? I've got a package of 100% semolina spaghetti that says that a two ounce serving has six grams of protein. And I don't know about you, but when I eat spaghetti, I eat more than two ounces. So there's plenty of protein in pasta. It's not a carb. Again, pasta is a processed food, not as healthy as a sweet potato, but it's not a carb. Only sugar in its many forms is a carb. Donuts are not carbs. Donuts have oil and they may have dairy or eggs. They're gonna be very high in fat as well as sugar. Donuts are unhealthy for more reasons than I can count, but they shouldn't be called carbs and thereby slander carbohydrate, the natural fuel for the human body and the sacred joining of carbon and water that makes life possible. To claim that there's anything wrong with carbohydrate, you have to claim that there's something wrong with all vegetables and almost all fruits. These are the healthiest foods on the planet, rich in fiber and antioxidants and vitamins and minerals. People never say that they're avoiding broccoli because they're trying to lose weight, but they do say that they're avoiding carbs because they're trying to lose weight. Yet most of the calories in broccoli come from carbohydrates, although there's also a good amount of protein and a bit of fat. So why do people associate carbohydrate with fat being fattening? For one thing, because sugar, which is truly carbohydrate, 100% carbohydrate, is terribly fattening. There are 1,775 calories in a pound of sugar, which is truly a carb. There are 350 to 400 calories in a pound of potatoes, a root vegetable, not a carb. So yes, carbs are fattening if you're eating a pure carb, but don't mislabel potatoes as carbs and then claim they're fattening. The magician Penn Jillette lost over 100 pounds eating a diet of nothing but potatoes. Then there's the conf conflation between carbohydrate and foods made of flour. People think of foods made from flour as carbs, bread, pasta, pizza, cakes, cookies. And indeed, these foods are calorically dense. 
Some breads are more processed than others. I believe that whole grain breads are healthy, but they're calorically dense because flours are compressed beaten grains that have lost some of their fiber. Pizza is fattening not only because of the flour, but mostly because of the oil and the cheese and any meat-based toppings. Cakes and cookies have sugar and fat. So the fallacy is to label processed foods that often have a lot of fat as carbs, then hold that against a perfectly innocent and crucial macronutrient. Most of your calories need to come from carbohydrate. They can't come from anywhere else without throwing off your body chemistry and endangering your health. Plants provide carbohydrate. Just as there is no fiber in meat, there's no carbohydrate in meat. So once again, we have a no-brainer macronutrient category. When it comes to carbohydrate, which is indispensable to life, plants provide it and flesh foods simply do not. So clearly plants are superior to animal foods when it comes to macronutrient three, carbohydrate, that brings us to fat. Now, the advocates of the paleo diet and the keto diet want to try to convince you that fat doesn't make you fat. Okay, what does? Cauliflower? Apples? The argument is so preposterous that it's hard to take seriously. Look, we know what contributes to obesity. Highly caloric foods, including some vegan ones. Alcohol, all forms of isolated sugars and oils, which are 100% fat, and flesh foods, which are usually in the range of 50% fat, and dairy foods, which are extremely high in fat. When you eat a whole foods vegan diet, and if you eliminate or absolutely minimize sugar, oil, and alcohol, it's all but impossible to get fat. Now, you need some fat in your diet. It's one of the macronutrients after all. So what's the problem with eating too much fat? To start with, it's nine calories per gram instead of the four calories per gram of carbohydrate. So over time, if you're eating a diet that's got 35 or 40% of your calories coming from fat, of course you'll gain weight compared to a diet that's 10% fat. Now, just in my lifetime, the average middle-aged woman or man is about 25 to 30 pounds heavier than they were when I was a boy. Since 1960, the prevalence of adult obesity in the U.S. has more than tripled. Since 1970, the prevalence of obesity... Uh, has more than tripled among children from 5% to 17% today. I like to note that since Obamacare went into effect in 2013, giving upwards of 20 million Americans more access to medical care, obesity in America has increased from 36% to 42%. So going to the doctor clearly isn't a very effective way of combating obesity. Nobody should be fat shamed, but we can't pretend when we discuss health and nutrition that obesity is anything other than a disease state. Being obese is statistically associated with greater all-cause mortality, heart disease, hypertension, and cancer. Uh, uh, stroke, high cholesterol, fatty liver disease, gout, fertility problems, respiratory problems, arthritis, and more. And when you have what's called metabolic syndrome, this group of conditions that are linked, obesity, high, um, heart disease, high cholesterol, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, each condition contributes to the other. Is it the obesity that causes the hypertension that causes the heart disease? Well, about 75% of people who have hypertension are obese. Why are all these diseases linked? because it's the cheeseburger that causes the obesity and causes the heart disease and the high cholesterol and the type 2 diabetes and the high blood pressure. These diseases are all linked because they have the same cause, the fatty animal-based Western diet. Now, it's not only animal foods that make the Western diet fatty. Oil is also a factor. But all these fatty foods can result in high cholesterol teaming up with saturated fat to create atherosclerotic plaques that attack the arteries and ultimately the heart. Of all the mammals, how many develop atherosclerosis? You have your answer? Here it is. Here is the list of all the mammals who develop atherosclerosis. That's the complete list. We should have been able to deduce that we are herbivores since the year 1913, when a Russian fellow named Nikolai Nikolaevich Anichkov 
working at a lab in St. Petersburg, fed cholesterol from egg yolks to some poor, unsuspecting rabbits, and thereby brought on atherosclerotic plaque and lesions. It was thereafter established that when you feed cholesterol to omnivores and carnivores, such as dogs and cats, atherosclerosis never develops. Atherosclerosis, therefore, is a disease that develops only in herbivores. And it develops, of course, in humans. Therefore, humans are herbivores. We're the only animal to develop atherosclerosis because all the other herbivores are intelligent enough to not eat meat, and all the omnivores and carnivores are biologically protected against developing it. Atherosclerosis affects only herbivores that make the mistake of eating meat, and we're the only species stupid enough to qualify. Please don't be offended. I want to apologize if I've insulted your species. Getting back to fat. Americans are way too fat, and animal foods are, of course, extremely fatty, often with 50% or more of their calories coming from fat. And we know that the saturated fat and trans fats in meat and dairy are particularly dangerous. You would think that we've arrived at a no-brainer, as the obvious lesson becomes eating animals damages our bodies because, among other factors, they're simply too fatty. But Americans can't give up on eating animals, certainly not just because the science tells them so. So along comes the keto diet to try to convince you that eating the bulk of your calories from fat is a good thing. Now, you may ask, how could it possibly be a good for Americans to eat more fat if they're already eating tons of fat and they're extremely fat and sick? That should be a rhetorical question. And yet the keto geniuses have come up with an answer. They claim that eating a lot of fat is good for you because it leads to the state of ketosis, which they admit gives you bad breath and constipation and dehydration and fatigue and brain fog and increases your risk of developing kidney stones and gout and osteoporosis and could make you pass out. And still, amazingly enough, it's highly desirable to achieve that wonderful state of ketosis in which fat rather than carbohydrate becomes your fuel because, wait for it, there are people who claim they've lost weight that way. That's it. That's the reason for this obscenely unnatural diet in which you have to be scared of apples. Unfortunately, a good deal of the weight these keto dieters lost may have been water weight since a high-fat, high-protein diet is going to stress your kidneys as they struggle to expel all that unwelcome protein and acid load. In order to attain the glorious state of ketosis, you need to consume something like 80% of your calories as fat. Roast beef is not nearly sufficient. It's way too lean. In order to reach 80% of your calories as fat, you'll need to put a stick of butter on your roast beef and wash it down with some oil. People actually strive to attain this glorious, unnatural state of ketosis in spite of the bad breath and constipation and dehydration because they believe it'll make them nice and trim, really. Still, we do need fat. And the healthiest fats you can find are in flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, avocados, and walnuts, plant foods that are all high in omega-3 fatty acids. The proportion of fat is excessive and dangerous in animal foods, while most plant foods are low fat. And the plant foods that are rich in fat, nuts, seeds, avocados, have much higher, healthier fat profiles than animal foods. Given that the fat in meat, eggs, and dairy is excessive and has the slight drawback that it can make you fat and sick and diabetic and can kill you, whereas most plant foods are healthfully low in fat, we can conclude that fat is a slam dunk. You're far better off getting your fat in the right amount from plants. The score is now plants four, animals zero. We move on to macronutrient number five. You know what the waiters ask. What's your choice of protein, chicken, pork, beef, or fish? Well, this begs the question, is meat a protein? No, meat is not a protein. It's roughly half protein and half fat. So we could just as well call meat a fat. You don't get to pick your favorite macronutrient and label a food accordingly. Ben and Jerry's chocolate chip cookie dough vanilla ice cream has five grams of protein in a serving. 
Maybe we should label that a protein too. Meat is muscle tissue from a dead animal, full of fat and cholesterol and toxins and endotoxins, as well as protein. T. Colin Campbell demonstrated in the China study that animal protein is carcinogenic. It's high in the amino acid methionine, which is implicated in the growth of cancers. Dr. Campbell's work proved that while animal protein brought on cancer, plant protein did not. Therefore, there should really be no dispute that plant protein is superior to animal protein. It's also superior because it's not excessive. Excessive protein does the human body no good because the body cannot store protein. You simply excrete it, and an overload of protein causes an acid load that stresses the kidneys. So there is no macronutrient for which you could find an advantage in eating animal flesh. The final score of the five known and established macronutrients is five to zero in favor of plants. There's no macronutrient uh, for which you could find any advantage in eating flesh or dairy. Now you can imagine the embattled defender of the paleo or keto diet conceding now, okay, so the whole food vegan diet is superior for the five macronutrients, but what about the micronutrients? Vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, beef is full of vitamins and minerals. Well, where does a cow get the vitamins and minerals? From eating plants. There isn't a single vitamin or mineral that we need to cycle through an animal in order to obtain it. We could obtain it the way the animal does from eating plants. And antioxidants are hugely important. They prevent oxidative stress to your brain cells, to your heart cells, to your eyes, to your organs. They reduce inflammation. They can prevent cancer. And they're essentially only in plant foods. You don't eat sausages to get antioxidants. You eat berries and all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Toxins accumulate in the food chain and get stored in the liver and in the fatty tissues of animals. The grain that we feed to animals is almost never grown organically. It's heavily sprayed. The bigger fish that eat the smaller fish will be more likely to have higher levels of toxins. Plants filter out toxins. Organically grown plants are your best bet to clean, to clean food without toxins. How about the endotoxins? Well, all food animals, whether they're from concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFOs, or are grass-fed, organically range, free range, and America, in America, it's about 99% CAFOs, but all of them are killed in the same slaughterhouses. And when you cut open a dead, an a dead animal, the guts pour out. So every surface in a slaughterhouse is contaminated with E. coli, salmonella, and all kinds of harmful bacteria. In the meat cases of your local grocery store, the cuts of meat are exposed to ultraviolet light to kill the bacteria and parasites. They don't have to do that with blueberries because blueberries aren't filthy with harmful organisms, but they have to do it with sirloin steak. So hopefully it works and kills the bacteria and cooking will certainly kill the bacteria, but these toxins turn into endotoxins, which are the main component of the outer membrane of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria. Uh, endotoxins are heat stable. You can't cook them out. When people eat meat, they kill all the bacteria with cooking, but them, they're giving themselves a dose of endotoxins three times a day. Let me skip now to the six macronutrients. The macronutrients are what you need to absorb in order to live. Well, you can't live without some optimism. So optimism is the sixth macronutrient according to, let's see, was it a study in the New England Journal of Medicine? Oh, no, it's according to me. And you have to ask yourself, do you feel more optimism when you look at fruit trees or at a confined animal feeding operation? What leads to more hope, the smell of fresh bread or the smell of a pig lagoon? What makes you feel more joy in being alive, a farmer's market full of fruits and vegetables or a slaughterhouse? Forests or barren land burnt by cow grazing? If you go to my YouTube channel, you'll find an interview with Dr. Silish Rao, whom I call the avatar of optimism. I hope you'll take a few moments to watch that. Because what we're trying to do here the seemingly impossible goal of transforming the world to be a vegan, nonviolent place is an optimistic undertaking. And so it's a healthy undertaking. The healthiest activity you can engage in is in creating a more vegan world. It may seem hopeless sometimes to convince others to go vegan, but it takes hope to try. So it's a healthy thing for you to do.
Now, remember this alarming quote, vegans have a greater prevalence of mental health problems, which may lead to a poorer qual quality of life. Let's analyze it. First, there's no evidence that vegans have a greater prevalence of mental health problems. I read a meta study on the subject that found that 44% of the outcomes indicated that vegetarian and vegan diets were associated with higher rates of depression. 28% revealed beneficial effects of the vegan diet of depression, and 28% uh, found no association. So you have completely meaningless results that prove nothing. And there's no logic to believing that a berry or a zucchini causes depression, while a lamb chop will cheer you up. So the first sentence, presented as if it's true, is in fact utter nonsense. Second sentence, an optimal diet should be balanced. Well, that's meaningless. Balanced in what way? Between healthy and unhealthy foods? Between processed and unprocessed foods? Between clean foods and filthy foods rife with bacteria? What kind of balance are we aiming for here? Why are we aiming, striving for balance instead of health? consisting of lean meat. Lean meat doesn't exist. It's like clean coal. It's a marketing ploy. It's not a thing that exists. Meat has, has a PR problem that it's full of saturated fat and trans fats, and these are terribly unhealthy fats that can kill you. So the solution the industry has come up with has been to invent something called lean meat, which does not exist. You may have noticed that I used the, just a few more slides now. You may have noticed that I used the phrase, it just so happens, several times in this presentation. Animal agriculture just so happens to have a horrific impact on our land as the leading cause of deforestation and biodiversity loss, pollutes our waterways, and is a leading cause of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It just so happens that dietary fiber is crucial to creating metabolites that improve our health and even metabolites that can improve our mood. It just so happens that metabolites from meat consumption are dangerous. The study found that it just so happens that diets with larger amounts of saturated fat, animal products, and carbohydrates may induce endotoxemia more markedly than diets containing fiber-rich plant-based food. Well, of course, it doesn't just so happen. It happens because we are primates, cousins to the great apes, who eat a plant-based diet, practically a vegan diet, and that's how we evolved to eat. We are herbivores, and every time we stray from that, it just so happens that we damage our health and our world. That is what you need to know and convey to others to help promote a vegan world. These are my latest books. You can contact me through glennmerzer.com. And please subscribe to The Glenn Merzer Show on YouTube. I'm, I'm just started this in the last year. I'm nearing 1,000 subscribers, so I would love it if you would subscribe. I will stop the share now. And I'm back. Wow, fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that was terrific. Thank you, Ted. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Friedman, would you like to reveal yourself, please? Uh, there we are. Okay. And um, I think that was a fantastic presentation. You already got lots of compliments in the uh, in the chat. Uh, it's just so well organized. Actually, I've been doing this for a really long time, but I've never any heard anybody talk about the five major macronutrients because I never thought of water and fiber as being one of those. So that's great. Yeah. Did you Did you come up with that? No, um, you know, traditionally it's been the three, but uh, yeah. more and more I'm seeing mm. fiber and water um, being included. And and mm. it really should. These are the five things you need to live. Right. That's great. That's terrific. Thank you. Dr. Friedman, have we got some questions? Um, uh, first question, uh, what foods would be most beneficial while undergoing radiation and chemotherapy? I defer to Ted. Ah, boy. You know, um, I'm going to defer to Dr. Clapper on that one. He's not here. So, um, you know, basically, we're, we're, the answer almost always is a whole food plant-based diet, right? That's kind of the answer because you just want to have a healthy body generally. So I can't say specifically which of, you know, the whole foods is going to be the most beneficial. But for most people, if you're talking to somebody who's already on a standard American diet, you're just going to refer them to a, um, you know, a whole food plant-based diet. But again, if that's the situation you're in, you're going to want to study it a little more than 
uh, what I just said. So I, I would uh, um, uh, look for anything by Dr. Clapper. Dr. McDougall also talks about it a bit. Um, so yeah, I would get, and you know, you could also, if 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 that's your situation, I would check in with um, Love Life Health Telehealth. Um, they are uh, a you know a national organization with doctors licensed in every state. In fact, our our new medical director, Dr. Kerry Graff, is actually on the staff there as well. So um, there, that was a non-answer. Back to you, Dr. Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, next question is: uh, Please address the fallacy that. The Mediterranean diet um, is the panacea of diets. Right. Well, the Mediterranean diet is a diet that involves a lot of whole plant foods, fruits and vegetables. So uh, the, the people in you know Greece and Italy who practice the Mediterranean diet often do better than Americans, certainly do better than Americans who are going to fast food places because they're getting a lot of fruits and vegetables. So that is raising the quality of their diet. Now, they also use olive oil. Well, olive oil is not a health food. It's 100% fat. But in my opinion, it's probably better than, or it's certainly better than butter and other fats. Um, and if you're not cooking the olive oil, but you're adding it raw, it's less problematic than if it's cooked. Um, so to the extent that uh, the Mediterranean diet has a lot of whole plant foods and has olive oil rather than butter or rather than margarine, um, that, all that is to the good. They, it also tends to have a minimal amount of animal foods. Like some people say, I practice the Mediterranean diet and I, I eat fish twice a week. Well, if you eat fish twice a week, you're going to do better than if you eat meat three times a day. So in other words, the Mediterranean diet is, compared to most diets, a pretty good diet. Therefore, people say, oh, I have a friend on the Mediterranean diet, lost weight, is doing well. And I say, yeah, you want to do even better? Cut out the olive oil and don't have any fish or meat. Right. Uh, go with a whole food, plant-based, low-fat, low vegan diet. Yeah, I would second that. Also, it's not clear that the Mediterranean diet has to have you know, half a cup of olive oil in it. It's probably, you know, and, and originally it was a few tablespoons or maybe mm -hmm. a tablespoon a day, something right. along those lines. So, yeah. You know, I have a question. Um, that quote from Gary Taubes, who I mm. never saw that quote before, but I always regard Gary Taubes as being a thorn in the side. Uh, when did he say that? What was the story there? Uh, you know, I would have to go back to the article, which article it was, I don't remember, but his wife is a vegetarian. Okay, just remind people what that quote was about. The the quote is that he he said that you know from a from a humane perspective, you know uh, the the vegan diet. He said something like the the, the vegan diet is is uh, you know is better from a per perspective of being more humane, and then from the point of view of the planet, it's clear that a plant based diet is better for the planet. He acknowledges that. Right. And there's really no, I mean, I don't, I don't know anyone who argues that it's better for the animals to, to, to confine them and then slaughter them. And I don't know anyone who argues that it's better for the planet to chop down forests and give them over to, to either growing soy to feed to animals or, or, or grazing animals. There's no way to defend it. So the the argument that keeps the meat industry in business is that people actually think it's healthy. Right. And that's the argument that we have to defeat. And there is no good case to be made for eating meat. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I, we always brag about how Rochester is a hotbed of um, lifestyle medicine and um, veganism. And actually, Gary Tobbs is also from Rochester. <laughs> is he? <laughs> He has, some, he has a Rochester connection anyway, yeah. So I think he actually is from here, but I'm just going to share my screen here before we um, get to the end here. So uh, just for uh, <clears throat> people who joined us after the introduction, I just want to remind people out there that in order to, uh, to veganize the planet, which is uh, our goal, and uh, Dr. and uh, Glenn Mercer's goal as well, we just heard him say it, we need to have uh, practical programs for people to actually um, uh, move in that direction. So we have our own 15-day whole food plant-based jumpstart, which has now reached... Uh, about 2,500 people around the uh, uh, the world. We've uh, 44 states and nine countries. We give it every month. 
Uh, about 300 doctors from around the country have uh, referred their patients to us at one time or another. If you know any doctors or you're a doctor and you know any patients who could benefit, please just send them to our website. It's very easy to sign up. Uh, there's even a referral uh, um, form actually right on our website if you're a, a, a healthcare practitioner. And you can also, the, the same with the LIFT project, which is uh, um, whole food plant-based, but also about the other pillars of lifestyle medicine. And again, we do um, uh, the... Uh, we do have uh, health coaching. Um, if you uh, um, are so moved, we'd love it if you could donate. We are a nonprofit uh, organization. We do have we do pay our staff. My wife and I are full time volunteers. I make my living actually as a radiologist, but we do pay our staff, and uh, so we are dependent on uh, donations and grants. So uh, if you want to aim your phone at that QR code, uh, I'll leave it up for a second. But also we'll put the uh, link in the uh, chat. If uh, Bob could do that, that would be great. All right. Well, I think that's. Uh, uh, we're going to call it a wrap. Um, Glenn Merzer, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. It was really quite brilliant. And yes, unique, I have to say it was different from, you know, so many of the presentations we have. Not that they're not great. They're also great. But yours is really uh, a, a great way to look at things. Uh, thank you, Dr. Friedman, for helping to uh, um, field the questions and also just for being you in general. And yes. uh, thank you, uh, Bob Frankie, uh, for being our engineer tonight. And thank you all uh, in the audience for coming and joining us. And we'll see you around the pale blue dot. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.